in this video we'll talk through the bonding and structure topic from National 5 Chemistry Unit 1. By the end of this video, you should be able to state the different types of bonding and structure that you need to know about, be able to identify these from diagrams, be able to explain the attractions that hold substances together, and be able to use properties of compounds to predict bonding and structure. Start off with a very basic general overview, where if we have got metallic bonding, we'll find that in metallic. Valent bonding, we tend to find between non-metals. And ionic bonding we tend to find between metals. These are usually the case, but there are some exceptions. You just need to be aware there is limitations to this sort of thinking. We can use this as a starting point, but we look at the chemical, we identify which type of elements, and predict which type of bonding it may have. Look at sulfur fluoride, that has non-metals within it, therefore it would be predicted to have covalent bonding. Sodium iodide has metal and a non-metal, you would predict it to be ionic. And in mercury, it's a metal element, so that's going to have metallic bonding. Look at each of these in more detail. We'll start off with our metallic bonding. And you'll have a diagram that looks a bit like this. One of the key things for metallic bonding is that the outer electrons are delocalized. They are free to move. Sometimes described as being a sea of delocalized electrons. There's then an attraction between the positively charged metal ions and those negatively charged delocalized electrons. That's what holds them together. In other cases, there are two ways that a substance can obtain a full outer shell of electrons, give it a stable arrangement. They'll either share their outer electrons to form a covalent bond, or they'll transfer their outer electrons to form an ionic bond. Starting with covalent, first of all, when you have chemicals which have not got a full outer shell, if they join together in such a way that their overlap and the electrons are shared between them, you then form a covalent bond. Looking more closely at it, the positive nuclei of each are attracted to that shared pair of electrons, you have positive and negative attracted to one another. And it's that attraction which holds them together. That's what's termed as a covalent bond. Covalent compounds can be either molecular or networks. Water and methane are examples of covalent molecular, where we've got small groups of atoms joined together, whereas things like carbon diamond and carbon graphite would be covalent networks. For much larger structures, lots of atoms join together. Types of exam questions you can get, you can be asked to draw a diagram which shows the outer electrons in a particular chemical. Here we've got carbon hydride, which is made up of carbon hydrogen. We're only showing their outer electrons. We've got one for hydrogen and we've got four for carbon. What can then happen is that the hydrogens can attach on, overlapping, to form covalent bonds. And it means that hydrogen now has two electrons, which gives it a stable arrangement, and carbon has eight in total, so therefore it's got a stable arrangement. An ionic bonding, there's a transfer of outer electrons to form an ionic bond. Sodium is going to transfer its outer electron over to chlorine. We then have sodium has lost an electron, so it's now got a one positive charge, whereas chlorine has gained an electron, and it's now got a one negative charge. I'm going to talk about what ions are. Talk before about the fact that atoms have equal numbers of protons and electrons. A particle does not have equal numbers of these, then going to be termed as an ion. If they lose electrons, they'll become positively charged and are called cations. So positively charged cations. And if they've gained electrons, they'll become negatively charged anions. Typically, it would be metals that become positive and non metals would from negative. When we look at the attraction that holds together ionic compounds, there's a force of attraction between the positively charged metal ion and the negatively charged non-metal ion. These will form a regular repeating arrangement called a lattice, and that's the picture that I've got on screen. Now. Sticking with the ions theme for a minute, one of the things that you can be asked about is flame testing. So, perhaps done this. Um, in class, 
where you take a metal solution or a piece of metal, put it into a flame, and then the flame is going to change colour. Different metals give different colours. Flame tests can be used to identify which particular metals present. This is found on page 6 of the data booklet, where they show you which colour it turns. In terms of questions, one thing they can do is they can ask you about a particular chemical and a particular flame colour. So a lilac flame, which suggests it's potassium. Potassium has an atomic number of 19. This means that it's going to have 19 guns. And that gives the answer of D. Looking at each of the types of bonding side by side, we need to be able to identify which diagram goes with which type of chemical. So we'll go through typical questions that they can ask. First couple of questions will just be which diagram represents which structure and bond. We have covalent network, and a covalent network is a large structure of uncharged atoms that matches the letter A in this question. We can ask you about a covalent molecular substance. This time we're looking for a small group of uncharged atoms, and that's going to match up to C. Make life a little more tricky for you, what can be done is they can ask you about a particular chemical, and we've got one extra step. We need to identify that copper is a metal. Metals contain delocalized electrons, that gives us an answer of D. Similarly, if we've got sodium chloride, sodium chloride is a metal and a non-metal, so it's likely it's going to be an ionic lattice that matches up letter B in this question. Looking at which type of elements are involved can give us an idea of which type of bonding. Also use electrical conductivity, solubility, melting points and boiling points to help determine the structure and bonding. We look at conductivity first of all. You can test it in a few different ways. One of the most common ways is just to hook it up to a battery, have it running through a voltmeter or a bulb, and you look and see when you place substance into our circuit, does electricity flow or not? If it does, we can say it's a conductor of electricity. If it doesn't, it would be an insulator in terms of conductivity. We'd perhaps have looked at some elements where we have our metallic elements do conduct electricity, whereas our covalent elements do not conduct electricity. The only exception to this rule is carbon in the form of graphite. And that does conduct the electricity. Compounds you need to be aware of which state the compound is in when tested. This does have an effect on its conductivity. Our metals will always conduct electricity. Valent substances do not conduct electricity except from carbon graphite. And ionic substances only conduct when molten or in solution. So if it's a solid, it's not going to conduct. The reason for this is that conduction involves the movement of charged particles. The metals contain delocalized electrons which can move. Ionic compounds contain ions. When they're in a solid, the ions are unable to move, but as a liquid or in solution, they are free to move. With the covalent compounds, they've got atoms, not charged particles. Therefore, they will not conduct electricity, apart from carbon graphite. In this question, we're asked about a solid ionic compound. Ionic compounds contain ions. As a solid, they will be held together. Gives us our answer of A. In this question, it's asking about copper and why copper conducts electricity. We should be aware that copper is a metal and metals have delocalized electrons. Therefore, the correct answer is D. Talks about electrons. In terms of dissolving in water, any ionic substances will be soluble in water. Be aware that chemicals which don't dissolve in water may dissolve in other solvents as well. Looking at melting points and boiling points, the data booklet has lots of information. Get the melting points and boiling points for metallic elements on page 5. And there are some covalent and ionic compounds on page 9, which gives you information. By looking at these tables, we can see that metals have high melting point and boiling points, so are solids at room temperature, except from mercury. Ionic substances tend to have high melting points and boiling points, 
and therefore be solids at room temperature. For covalent, if it's molecular, it's going to have a lower melting point and boiling point compared to our networks, which will have higher melting points and boiling points. In terms of questions that you can be asked, they can talk about a particular chemical, in this case, silicon oxide. It tells us it's covalently bonded and has a fairly high melting point and boiling point. Because it's covalent, this means it could be molecular or network. The higher melting point suggests network, therefore we have a covalent network structure within this. This question talks about titanium chloride, which is liquid at room temperature and does not conduct electricity. We're asked about the type of bonding present within it. If we were only using the metal and non-metal idea, this would suggest it's ionic. However, ionic substances would conduct when molten, when it's a liquid. The fact that it doesn't conduct electricity would suggest that we've got valent chemical and also having low melting points and boiling points resulting in a liquid at room temperature would also suggest it's covalent. This is the reason why I was quite adamant about saying that it's usually metals and non-metals to be ionic. You need to look at the properties involved to know a bit more confidently than it. In terms of the summary, we've got things about conductivity, melting points and boiling points. When we're tackling questions, I'm going to suggest that we look at conductivity first. Because conductivity can allow us to get to the answer quicker. And sometimes you can get the answer by only looking at conductivity. Other times we'll need to add in about melting points and boiling. Let's have a go at these questions. One of the questions we can be asked is just given different properties, which of these matches to, in this case, an ionic compound? Ionic substances conducts when it's liquid, but not when it's a solid. And when we look through the information, so the right hand side of the table, this matches to our answer of C. Just for completion, if we're to put in the other ones, phthalate compounds always conduct, which is the yes, yes in conductivity. Between the two covalents, which are no, no for conductivity, the network will have the higher melting point and boiling point compared to the molecular. So I would suggest start with conductivity and then use melting points and boiling points if you have to. Hopefully now you're able to state the different types of bonding and structure that we've got, identify the diagrams that apply to each of the cases, explain what holds them together in terms of positives and negatives, and then also use the properties of compounds to predict bonding and structure. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.